Yes, let's begin. Ashe is the word, the source of I and I ancestors. Ashe is a source that holds all things together. Ashe is I source, I shield and I protect her. Ashe is I source, I guide and I provide her. Ashe is I source. And that is why I am not black. Ashe is I source, I cannot be black. Ashe is I source, I light and I deliver her. Ashe is I source, I healer, and I teacher. Ashe is I source, I leader, and I spiritual fire. Ashe is I source, I strength. Each day I be more and more. Ashe is I source, I spiritual comforter. Each day I be more stronger. Ashe is I source, I sustainer. Each day my life is filled with more pleasure. Ashe walk with I daily to much green and greener pastures. Ashe walk with I beside some very cold and deadly waters. Ashe walk I through the valley of blackness and under the shadow of be lackness and so I fear no evil or what the devils may try to do for it's ashe I say ashe ashe I say to you all my highly enriched melanin my highly enriched carbon skin brothers and sisters my fellow Africans Mother Earth's original, Mother Earth's natural native and organic humans the world over. Ashe. And welcome back to one, welcome back one and all to this another perspective with I, the mystic philosopher. It's high time for reason and for reasoning. Please let me take this opportunity right here and now and say goodwill. To all those of you that have given and those of you that may give and all those of you that will give of your very limited and precious time to join in, to watch and listen to this video uh, broadcast and podcast. Goodwill to all those of you that take time out to subscribe to my YouTube channel called the right number and to my blog post at the mystic p.com goodwill to all those of you that may or will take time out to donate and to support what I'm doing and especially goodwill to all those that have and that may and that will purchase my music and message my messages in songs goodwill to all those of you that may or that will take the time out to participate in the discussions, to critique and to write comments. Goodwill to all those of you that may or that will intelligently, informatively, and respectfully rebut with the honest intent of highlighting or correcting any and all possible statements or information that you might perceive to be erroneous and misleading or that you can or that you may prove to be incorrect and misleading and goodwill to all those of you that will share your own perspectives on any of the topics that are covered in this or any series of lecture presentations by I, the mystic philosopher. Welcome. Thank you and goodwill to you all. Who I am. 
Now before I get into my prepared notes for this lecture, please let me briefly introduce who I think I am. And by so doing, share with you a little about myself, also known as the I self. And by briefly answering the questions, who I am and what I am. Now, I'm not expecting all of you that may watch or listen to this video to fully understand, understand, and overstand this that I'm about to say. But just for transparency and for your information and possible just to provoke and initialize a deeper level of thinking in some of you, I have to say it anyway. I am not myself. Or simply, or to simplify, I am not I self. But I self belongs to I. For example, I am not my physical body. In other words, the I is not the physical body. But the physical body belongs to the I. So please don't think that you are looking at I. Or that the image on your computer monitor that you are looking at is I. What you think that you are seeing is just the medium, the vehicle or the conduit, if you will, through which, through which I am speaking to you. Who I am. Simply put, I am. Yes, I am. I am what I am to you. Am I not what I am to you? Whatever you think or believe I am, that is what I am to you. In other words, I am what you perceive me to be. Or to be even more accurate, I am what you perceive the I to be. I can't tell you anything about who I am or what I think I am, but that won't change what you think I am or what you believe I am, or that won't change your perception or your belief of who I am to you. What I am. I am the mystic philosopher, a.k.a. Dr. David G. Jones, an inspirational speaker, a metaphysician, spiritual counselor, philosopher, free thinker, truth seeker, musician, poet, singer, songwriter, internet blogger, YouTuber, a happiness coach, and more. And I am becoming much, much more. Four of my favorite quotes that truly summed up some of my basic uh, life's philosophies are, and I quote, one, to think, I think, therefore I am, unquote. The 17th century French philosopher, René Descartes. Two, the, unex the unexamined life is not worth living. Unquote. The ancient Greek philosopher named Socrates. Now my interpretation of this statement is that if we are not examining our lives, example, if we are not asking questions, tough questions, I might add, and seeking answers about ourselves and about people, things and events that are in our lives and are affecting our lives, then our lives are worthless and meaningless. We might be just occupying space and time on this planet. And quite possible, we might be better off physically dead. And again, why? Because the unexamined life is not worth living. Three, my third quote, to seek the company 
is to seek and keep the company of those who seek the truth, but run away from those who have found it. Unquote. Vaclif Havel, former president of the Czech Republic. In other words, I always try my very best and in as much as it may be humanly possible to avoid people who are claiming to have found the truth. People who are claiming to have the truth. Those who are claiming to know the truth, you name them. And especially all those that are wrapped up, tied up, messed up and tangled up in the systems Jesus and the systems religions and all religions and belief systems. Fourth quote, speak your truth quietly and clearly and listen to others, even the dull and ignorant, they too have their story. Unquote. Max Ehrman, author of The Desert Arata. And I will have much more to say on this point later. First, my objectives. What are my objectives? Or what do I hope to achieve from doing this series of lectures and presentations? Well, my objectives are to share another perspective. My perspective, my truths, if you will. And just about any topic and subject, and especially some of those subjects that are controversial, or that may be con uh, considered controversial. And by doing so, hopefully I can, or hopefully I may be able to provoke and encourage my audience, and especially my highly enriched melanin people, my African people, and my fellow earthly humans, all those of you that will afford me the time just to listen to what I have to say. My objectives are to hopefully provoke and encourage you to further challenge yourselves mentally and to further expand your mind and your intellect through the process of reasoning, through the process of logic, critical and analytical thinking, through the process of metaphysics, philosophy and introspection, etc. And by my perspective aka my truth, I simply mean my point of view, my angle of observation, the way that I, the mystic philosopher, personally think I see, or think that I see, think that I know, understand, understand, and overstand things. And please note that I did not say the way that I see, know, understand, understand, and overstand, overstand things. But that I think that I see, think that I know, understand, understand, and overstand things. Because from my perspective, without thinking, I think I know nothing. Please ask yourself and answer yourself these four questions. One, what do you know without thinking? Or what do you know without having to think? Two, what can you know without thinking? Three, how do you know that you know without thinking? And four, how do you know that you don't know without thinking? From my perspective, the thing that people, and especially my melanin, my African people, are afraid of the most is this thing called thinking. I have found that we are afraid, collectively we are afraid to think. And not only are we afraid of thinking, and especially to think for ourselves, but we are also lazy to think. In fact, the thing that people find the most difficult to do is to think. And the thing, and the thing that is the most easy to do is to accept and believe as true all that which we have been told and the thoughts, ideas, and thinking of other people. And as a consequence, most of us have fallen victims and slaves and are held permanent captive to those that are thinking for us and to the system 
and its belief systems. And just to prove my point, I ask that we each please ask ourselves and honestly answer ourselves this question. What were the subjects that we were afraid of the most while we were in school? Or what are the subjects that most of us were afraid of the most in school? And most of us, if we are true to ourselves, will admit that the subjects and the classes that we were afraid of the most were mathematics and the sciences. And why was it so? It was because these subjects challenged us and forced us to think. And other than cheating and copying from other students, the ones that think for themselves, it was only in thinking and by thinking that we could individually find the solution to our math and science problems. And the same is true in our adult life today. The only way to find the answers and solutions to our many problems and our challenges is in, the, is in and through the process called thinking. We have and we must think our way through in order to be free. From my perspective, emancipating ourselves from mental slavery is through the process called thinking. Now, if you are one of those people that are afraid to think, or if you are one that is afraid of people that think, aka thinking people, and by accident you just happen to come across this my channel or this video please don't feel intimidated by me asking you to think or by us asking you to think for idem from idemistic philosophers perspective thinking does not mean that we will always see things eye to eye or that we must always have to see things eye to eye or that your point of view as a result of your own independent thinking will be put down will be scoffed upon or will be seen as being laughable or less significant etc etc not at all the fact is that as long as you are thinking and exhibit signs that prove that you are thinking i will respect you as long as you are thinking and are not afraid of thinking are not afraid of thinking people then it is almost guaranteed that together we will have more similarities than we will have differences. And we will be able to intelligently and respectfully minimize our differences and maximize our similarities. All that I am interested in is that you think. Even if you think that I am an idiot, all that I'm asking is that you think. Think before you answer. Think before you comment. And think before you do whatever. The topic of this series of lecture presentations is the art of living well. Another perspective and interpretation of Desiderata. And this will be part one. It will be a series. Part one, this is. So I will begin this series of lecture presentation by reading a quote from a book I came across right here online titled The Miniature Guide to the Human Mind How It Learns and How It Mislearns by Dr. Linda Elder and Dr. Richard Paul and I quote To live well is to live as a reasonable and ethical person Yet humans are not by nature rational or ethical. Humans are predisposed to operate in the world in narrow terms of how it can serve them. Their brains are directly wired into their own pleasure and pain, not that of others. They do not inherently consider the rights and needs of others. Yet humans have the raw capacity 
to become reasonable and ethical persons, to develop as fair-minded, skilled thinkers. But to do so requires, one, understanding how the mind works, and two, using this understanding to develop skills and insights. Unquote. What is living? And what is meant by living? First question. From my perspective, living means that a person or an animal or a natural thing such as a plant, etc. is physically alive as opposed to being physically dead. In other words, the life source, the life's energy, the life's essence, the essence of life, a.k.a. the spirit, has not yet separated or departed from the physical body, thereby rendering the body lifeless, also known as dead. And in some instances, the spirit of the individual has not totally separated and departed from the physical body. It might be outside the body, but it is still connected and hoovering over the body. To us mystics, this is known as when the silver cord is not broken. To us, one is not totally and physically dead until the silver cord is separated or severed. Uh, recently, I did a video on soul answer question and soulmate. And this is also another example of what I was talking about. When the soul meet with the physical body. That is, till death do they part. When the physical body is separated. When the silver cord is broken and the soul or the spirit is totally severed from the physical body. That I had explained in that video. Note that I said that one is not totally and physically dead until the silver cord is broken or severed because one can be brain dead or comatose etc now depending on the circumstance under which it occurs if or when the silver cord is broken or if or when the silver cord is snapped then the spirit may float around or hang around the body or hang around the environment for a while and just for your information, a while to us on this physical plane, also known as the third dimension, um, the space and time reality, could be a very, very long time. For in the spirit realm, the fourth dimension, or the astral plane, or the interdimension, the concept of time, or time itself, does not exist as it <clears throat> as it is in this dimension. And that is why sometimes the spirit, uh, the energy or the soul of the deceased has to be sent away or driven away by what is commonly known as cleansing rituals, etc. Again, depending on the circumstances under which it occurs, if or when the silver cord is broken or snapped, the spirit of the dead, aka the spirit of the deceased, will or may float around or are float away and hopefully be at rest at, and at peace with its source, a.k.a. the source of all sources. Now this is a whole subject within itself, but basic introduction. Depending on how a person dies, may depend on how long the spirit stick around and haunt you, or stick around. <laughs> but that's another subject within itself. And for those of us, or those of you that are Christians, that may have never heard of the silver cord, 
I mean, have no idea of what it meant. You may have never heard of it before. Please read your Bible. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and from a verse 6 to 7. And let me quote from the New International Version for you. And I quote, Remember him before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken before the pitcher is shattered at the spring and the wheel is broken at the well. And the dust returns to the ground it came from. And the spirit returned to God who gave it. Unquote. So when the silver cord, as I said again using the soulmate um, explanation, when the soul unites with the body, they meet together and become one, one body. That's a real soulmate. All other mates are just mates, be it classmates, roommates, sex mates, whatever mate. But the real and original solid soul meat is when body unites with spirit, with the soul. So, and that is one reason why it is customary after a person dies or when the the silver cord is broken. Right? That is one then that is one reason why it is customary for some of us to say after expressing condolences uh, to the family and friends of the deceased of the dead, the common saying is, May his or her soul rest in peace, or may his or her soul find rest, because there are many haunted souls. There are many souls that were forced out of, out of the body. Um, people refer to it as the term, you may have heard the term, untimely death. Um, accidents and uh, violent killing, etc., etc. Where some souls are just wandering, bouncing around. Some even causing a lot of problems in people's lives. Some are used to create problems, but that's another, that's another issue I won't get into. But the, 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 the request or the wishes of condolences that most people share is may his or her soul rest in peace. Or may they find rest or as I would say be at peace and be back with their source and ancestors. So that is the reason why a person is pronounced. That is the reason why when a person is pronounced physically dead, his or her physical body is called the remains. From my perspective, to be alive and functional as a natural human requires the combination, the cooperation, and the unification of at least three known components. Namely, one, the physical body. Two, the spirit or the soul. Three, that which is called the mind, aka body, soul, and mind, or body, spirit, mind. Please note that to be alive, aka to be living, does not automatically mean that a person or that a human is living up to his or her full potential, full capacity, or to his or her full capability as a human, and in particular as a natural native earthly human. Now, what is meant by live? From my perspective, to live implies that a person is physically alive and is existing in one of several states of existence on this plane. For example, it could be that he or she is existing in a state of consciousness and awareness, or it could be that he or she is existing in a state of unconsciousness and ignorance. It could be that he or she is existing in a state of being civilized or that he or she is existing in a state of being uncivilized. It could be that he or she is existing in a state of naturalized or unnaturalized. It could be that he or she is existing in a state of sanity or it could be that he or she is existing in a state of insanity. It could also mean that he or she is existing in a state of wealth 
or one of poverty, a state of goodness or a state of evil and confusion. You name it. State. Three. To live well is to live as a reasonable and ethical person. Now, what does it mean by to live well? From my perspective, to live well is to achieve the highest level of human achievement in this life and on this realm or on this plane. And the highest level of human achievement in this life and on this plane or on this realm is to be truly and naturally happy, a.k.a. to achieve true happiness. And to be truly and naturally happy is to be mentally, spiritually, and physically healthy. And all three components, mental, spiritual, and physical, must be in harmony and on one accord with each other and with nature and with our natural environment. And what do I mean by mentally, spiritually, and physically healthy? First, by mentally healthy, I mean that our individual mind is naturally at ease. In other words, it is not diseased or infected with diseased or diseases. And the same is true for our spiritual phys and physical health. They are not diseased or infected with diseases. And that is what I, the mystic philosopher, perceived mentally, spiritually, and physically healthy to mean. What is the mind? Or what is this thing called the mind? From my perspective, and for all intents and purposes, the thing called mind, or the thing called the mind, and to be even more specific, the thing called the individual human mind, is one invisible and intangible aspect of his or her totality. And it can be described as an individual fertile plot of land or an invisible um, piece of fertile ground, a.k.a. a fertile garden or an invisible fertile space. Fertile meaning that anything, any invisible seeds, or plants that are sowed or planted in it grow and flourish or they will grow and flourish most abundantly. Any invisible seeds or plants, be they good seeds or bad seeds, once entered into this invisible fertile garden or on this invisible fertile ground or more correctly, invisible fertile space, they will immediately begin to germinate, then grow and multiply multiple times over. And just for your information, the seeds that if or when sown, or if or when allowed to enter and grow in our fertile, or rather in our invisible fertile garden or fertile space called our mind, are known as inklings, notions, ideas, and thoughts. And it is the conscious invisible I, aka the individual owner, caretaker, and controller of that plot of invisible fertile space that is personally responsible for its security, its care, for its maintenance, and its upkeep. It is the conscious invisible eye, the invisible owner, caretaker and controller of that plot of invisible fertile space that is personally responsible for preventing all forms of unwanted and poisonous seeds from entering, germinating, growing and flourishing in the invisible garden or in the invisible space. And what are some of the things, the, 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 the diseases that infect the mind and make it diseased and diseased? Simply put, unnatural thoughts and ideas. 
contrary alien thoughts and ideas. Destructive thoughts, aka evil thoughts. Example, thoughts of greed, hate, selfishness, jealousy, deceit, covetousness, pride, discrimination. And the list goes on and on. And what are some of the things or the diseases that infects the spirit and make it diseased and diseased? Parasitic entities, aka parasitic energies, parasitic spirits, energy sucking spirits, parasitic alien entities, and, and spirits from other dimensions and interdimensions, parasitic alien spirits, unfamiliar spirits, etc., etc. And what are some of the things, the disease that affects and infects the physical, aka the body? That makes it diseased and diseased. Simply put, everything begins and ends in the thing called the mind. And the battle with all our enemies is for our mind. Therefore, whatever happened in the physical, aka the body, is just the direct manifestation of what is happening in the mind and the spirit. Or what has happened in the mind and the spirit. In other words, a corrupt or a compromised mind and spirit produce a corrupt or compromised physical body. From this, one can conclude that though one might be living, one may not be living well. In other words, one might not be living at his or her full and highest potential. And one might just be existing in an unhealthy state, also known as a state of unwellness. Now, what is meant by a reasonable and unethical person? Now, before I answer this question and give my perspective and understanding of what is meant by a reasonable and an ethical person or a reasonable and an ethical human and who a reasonable and an ethical person or human and in order that we might be on one accord let us carefully examine the meaning and definition of the words reason logic reasonable ethics and ethical and also please let me take time out here just to quickly remind all my trolls and critiques alike and especially all those of you that in a disrespectful and demeaning way are quick to accuse me of my ignorance of this the English language, its grammar and its words, etc. And consequently of my constant need to use its dictionaries and my frequent use of the English dictionary to look up the meaning and definitions of its every word that I use in a sentence. Yes, you are all... You all are correct in pointing out and highlighting the fact that I am ignorant of the English language. A fact that I have admitted to the world time and time again. I have publicly admitted to the world that I am not English, that I am not British or Caucasian. This is a fact that no doubt should be quite self-evident to all those of you that have eyes to see, ears to hear, or ears that can hear, and intelligent minds. That can understand. Nor am I an English, British, or, ca or Caucasian wannabe. Neither. Far be it. I have admitted and declared, and I am still not ashamed to admit and declare the indisputable fact that the English language was not and is not the language of my ancestors. It is not my ancestral language. The English language is not my mother tongue or my mother's tongue. But that the English language is the language of my most honorable African ancestors, malevolent alien caucasoid invaders, conquerors, murderers, rapists, pedophilias, or pedophilias, or pedophiles, barbaric thieves, slave traders, slave drivers, slave masters, human traffickers, genocidal schemers, you name them. It is them, and by extension their ears and successors' language. Secondly, those of you that have listened to some of, some of, if not all of my previous lectures and presentations, 
talks, perspectives, songs, and semi the poetry, etc. Would have no doubt heard me say time and time again that language or that the thing called language is a code. And that another word for language is code. And that the purpose of a language or the purpose of the thing called language is to hide and disguise the secret of the people or owners of that language, aka that code. Third, I've also admitted that my ancestors and I were never taught the English language. But that at best, what we were taught, and conveniently taught I might add, was just a bastardized version or a bastard, our bastardized versions of the English language. And that the closest that I think that I can get or that I may get to knowing, interpreting and understanding their language, their mindset, their thoughts, their ideas and philosophies that are enveloped or disguised in their every word is via my frequent use of their various dictionaries. Therefore, any English word that I don't know, understand, understand or understand, I will be referring or referencing to its meanings and definitions from the English dictionaries. So please get used to it. So back to the question. What is meant by a reasonable and ethical person? Meaning and definition of the word reason. The power of the mind, and I quote, the power of the mind to think, understand, and to form judgment by process or by a process of logic. Unquote. And please note very carefully that reason is the power of the mind to think, understand, and form judgments by a process of logic and definitely not by faith, not by belief, not by believe or by believing, but it is by logic. And logic by meaning and definition is, and I quote, reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of validity. Unquote. Now, meaning and definition of reasonable. Of a person having sound judgment, fear and sensible. In other words, a person that is able to use the power of the mind to think, understand and to form judgment by a process of logic. Next, meaning and definition of ethics. Moral print, and I quote, moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. Unquote. Meaning and definition of ethical. Quote, conforming to accepted standard of conduct relating to moral principles or the branch of knowledge dealing with these. Unquote. From my perspective, a reasonable and ethical person is one whose behavior in life is governed by reason and moral principle or principles. It means a person that is fair and just. It means a person of honesty and integrity. It means a person of good conscience. It means a person that is respectful. It means a person of impeccable and unimpeachable character. It means a holistically healthy person, or at the very least, one that is striving to be holistically healthy. From this profound statement, and again I quote, to live well is to live as a reasonable and ethical person. We can and we, must, and we, and we also must logically conclude and affirm that unless a person or unless a human is reasonable and ethical, he or she is not living well and nor can he or she live well. In other words, regardless of his or her status in life, his or her status in society, be they presidents, prime minister, politicians, kings, queens, religious leaders, doctors, healthcare professionals, police officers, distinguished scholars and academicians, you name it or you name them. 
if he or she or if they are not reasonable and ethical if they are not reasonable and ethical people then he or she is a punk or they are punks and he or she is living like a punk or they are living like punks by punks I also mean that he or she or they are mentally physically and spiritually unwell <coughs> sorry. <coughs> sorry he or she <coughs> He or she or they are not, he or she or they are out of sync, underdeveloped, untrained, and is existing in a state of chaos and confusion, etc. Maybe he or she or they are sophisticated punks. Or maybe he or she or they are some unsophisticated punks. Maybe they are a, a, a high up punks or a low down punks. Maybe he or she are some financially rich and some materially wealthy punks. You name it. It's a punk. He or she or they are punks. From idemistic philosopher's perspective, as long as he or she is unreasonable and unethical, they are, li they are not living well. And they cannot live well. Or as long as they are not living as reasonable and as ethical humans, they are not living well. Consequently, they are punks. Three, humans are, dis are predisposed to operate in the world in narrow terms of how it can serve them. Unquote. The word predisposed by meaning and definition is to make someone liable or to make someone inclined to a specified attitude, action, or condition. Examples. One, a person or a people that is predisposed is one that is more likely than others to have a medical condition, for instance, diabetes or cancer. Two, a person or a people that is predisposed is one that is more likely than others to behave in a particular way. For instance, he or she is more likely um, to be a thief or a murderer, etc. From my perspective, not all humans are predisposed to operate in the world in narrow terms of how it, meaning the world, can serve them. However, the evidence will show, and the evidence has shown, that there are certain humans, or more correctly, certain humankind or kind of human among us that are indeed predisposed to operate and are indeed operating in the world in our terms of how it, meaning the world, can serve them and how it, the world, serve them and them alone. For example, I don't think that any reasonable and ethical human or a reasonable and ethical person can say that the natives and the original peoples of North America that inhabited the land and coexisted in a harmonious and balanced way with our mother nature and all other life forms for thousands of years prior to being invaded by the punks can say or would say that they were predisposed to operate or that they operated in the world in our terms of how it can serve or how it could serve them and them alone. I honestly don't think that any reasonable and ethical person or reasonable and ethical human can or would say that my most honorable African ancestors, aka the, nat the native and original peoples of the land or of the continent that is today called Africa, my people that inhabited the land and coexisted in a harmonious and balanced way with our mother nature and all the other animal life forms of the land for hundreds of thousands of years, if not for millions of years prior to being invaded by the punks, can say, or would say, that they were predisposed to operate or that they operated in the world in our, in our terms of how it, the world, can and could serve them and them alone. I refuse to accept that. 
Moreover, our basic activated common sense will prove to us that it is not true. But more on that point at another time and another place. Fourth, their brains are directly wired into their own pleasure and pain, not that of others. From my perspective, the evidence will show, and the evidence has shown, that it is the creatures, aka the invaders, the alien conquerors, the oppressors and slave masters, the slave traders, etc., the original punks and their years and successors, punks among us today, whose brains are directly wired into their own pleasure and pain, not that of others. These alien creatures know no empathy, and they have no empathy, if at all, humanity. And because of their inherent robotic, mental, and mechanical programming, nor can they. Fifth, they do not inherently consider the rights and needs of others. From my perspective, the evidence will show, and the evidence has shown that it is the creatures, the invaders, the conquerors, the oppressors and the slave masters, the original punks and their heirs and successors, punks among us today, who do not inherently consider the rights and needs of others. In other words, they are predisposed not to consider the rights and needs of anyone other than themselves. Six, yet humans have the narrow, rather, yet humans have the raw capacity to become reasonable and ethical persons, to develop as fear minded, skilled thinkers. But to do so requires one, understanding how the mind works, two, using the, this understanding to develop skills and insights. Unquote. So, according to these two doctors, these humans do have the raw capacity to become reasonable and ethical persons, to develop as fear-minded, skilled thinkers. But to do so requires one, understanding how the mind works, and two, understanding, rather using this understanding to develop skills and insights. To this I must honestly admit that I have my doubts. But as my late mother would say, the longest liver will tell the most. The fact is that we, the natural native earthly humans, we, the earth's organic, pre-Adamic and highly melaninated humans, aka, Afri AKA Africans, have devolved. We have fallen from our natural and native status and have become unreasonable and unethical just like the creatures. Just like our conquerors, oppressors and slave masters, the punks. We have been dominated by them, infested by them, and have learned and, and, and is practicing their evil, unreasonable and unethical ways. Therefore, in order for us melanin people, aka African people, the earth's natural native earthly humans, in order for us African peoples to again live well and not just merely survive or merely exist, we have to be restored to our original natural native earthly human status while others will have to be trained to be like us. This is the end of part one of this my series of presentation titled The Art of Living Well Another Perspective and Interpretation of Desiderata And I thank you for listening thus far Please join me in part 2 for the continuation and much more detailed expressions on this topic The Art of Living Well Another Perspective and Interpretation of Desiderata I am the Mystic Philosopher it's high time for reason and for reasoning. Ashe, 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 Ayase.